Well, 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 good I morning. Guess. Wow, there's a lot of people here. I wasn't expecting so many of you to be here after seeing some of you last night. Um, I could almost smell the caffeine, actually. Yeah, fantastic. Hey, it's great, great to be here. Um, before we get started, Nick, I just need to remind everybody, you've probably heard this a million times already, but uh, you've got the Slido app. Make sure that you get your questions in as you listen to Nick and listen to his story. And uh, as we get towards the end, or maybe in between, I'll interject some of your questions too. So uh, do put them in. Uh, and don't do that thing where you just stay anonymous. Make sure you put your name in there. If it says anonymous, I'm assuming that some rebel hacker group is actually asking all the questions, okay? So, um, Nick, it's great to be here this morning with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, we want to just get into how you built Revolut, but first of all, most good startups start with a problem. You know, what was the problem you were trying to solve and why did you care so passionately about it? Well, I was uh, in my previous life a trader uh, and uh, I could calculate, you know, how much I pay in fees uh, in my head every time when I go abroad uh, and spend with a card. And I was always uh, kind of you know, pissed off about it, right? So first I tried to solve this problem for myself. And then I uh, decided to, to build a business out of it. Um, the obvious question is, were you a good trader? I was very good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you wanted to go and do a startup instead, right? <laughs> yeah, just uh, in the bank, I already kind of you know, reached uh, the top. And uh, yeah, well, what to do next? Yeah. So what's, what's the exact problem that you were trying to solve? What was the thing that really got you going and that uh, got you to the point where you said, look, this is, this is something that everybody has to deal with. I need to fix this. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I always wanted to, to run my own business, right? And then uh, secondly, uh, when the banking industry became you know, very regulated and uh, very political as well, so it wasn't uh, fun anymore. And uh, I decided for me, it was you know, time to, to move on on my own. Very cool. And uh, so you've grown pretty quickly and uh, we'll talk about things like the funding, you know, as we go through, but you know, one of the things that always uh, I look at when I look at companies that grow very fast, add a lot of users very quickly, there's usually two ways to achieve that. One is to do it organically, and with organic growth, that builds a different kind of community to when you build uh, using, you know, just advertisements and, and getting people to basically turn up because you're buying them. So, you know, which of those two routes did you take? So we, we never paid for marketing, and we are still not paying for marketing. So we think that you know, if you have a great product, why would you need to pay Facebook or Twitter or Google like, you know, to, to promote it? Uh, I remember when we started uh, two, two and a half years ago, uh, we were having like, I don't know, five, ten users a day, and we struggled a bit. Uh, our first uh, business developer he actually went to, I don't know, Cafe Nero or something, you know, coffee shop, and you know, start uh, giving cards away, just you know, to, to boost the growth. So yeah, we well, like, you know, came from 10 users a day to 20, then 30, then 40. Now it's like you know, five to 10,000 new, new customers a day. Yeah, just you, you need to start. That's, that's the main point. How do, how do people find out about you, you know, before you, you really started motoring? Because it's not easy to build organically. It does build a, usually a better community, people who actually care about your product. Whereas when you buy people, you know, they don't necessarily care that much. So um, that's great. I mean, organic community growth is, is wonderful because you get lots of word of mouth. But you've got to get people to actually talk about you in the first place. How did you achieve that? Uh, to be honest, I think we were just lucky maybe. So we tried, you know, so many things, so many stupid things as well. And then, you know, some of them worked. <laughs> what are the stupid things you did? And I mentioned you, like, you know, this cafe Nero, you know, going there and just, you know, giving, giving cards. Um, a lot. I mean, uh, yeah, just, just trying to, to give, uh, you know, a card to uh, any person that you meet. Or, like, have, have yourself a target, okay, I meet, like, 10 people a day and give them cards, right? Obviously, it's, it's, it's not scalable, but uh, initially it works. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, I've seen quite a lot of people talk over the years about user growth. And one of the things that they've said is that initially uh, they have to do things that just won't scale. And it's, it's impossible to, to get scale uh, initially anyway. But uh, doing things that won't scale, for example, um, sitting and doing handwritten notes to people, which is very time consuming, but because it's so personal, they feel like they absolutely have to latch on to you. 
Um, did you do any, uh, any other things other than just you know, cards? Is there any, any other examples you can give? Well, I remember I went to factories, you know, to work on card design, and, you know, I went to factories to work on uh, design of the packages. And because we were new to, to the industry, we wanted to, to have, you know, something cool. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, basically design that we selected, like, you know, three years ago, it worked, like, you know, for three years ago. Now we're switching to a new one, which is, you know, more, more professional. But yeah, a lot of things we, we've done ourselves first. So we, we, we didn't really hire you know, professional designers to do. And so how many users do you have now? And, and how long did it take to get to, I think you're, you, you reached a million users pretty quickly, right? How long was that? Uh, so right now we have about one half million users. Uh, so we reached a million users in, uh, I think about two years, a year and a half. And uh, from the point of view of, of the growth curve, um, you know, how did that look? Was there a point where you just said, yes, this is absolutely working? Or were there things that you had to change within uh, the, the app, and within the, the solution, um, to basically stop it from stalling? Was there any a point where you said, we've got to pivot here, or we've got to change, or we've got to fix this problem? Yeah, obviously we do it uh, every day, right? So there are different teams which look at uh, UI, UX, um, fixing problems all the time, right? Because the reality is that for 100,000 of users, uh, the product might work. Uh, there'll be you know, a few corner cases, say two, three, but for one and a half million users, it's uh, this corner case already for 20, 30 people, right? And then, then, then you need to fix it. What are some of the things that stopped you from, from growing that you had to fix? Give us a couple of examples of, uh, of things that went wrong. Oh, so, so, so many things. Uh, I remember almost exactly a year ago, uh, uh, we stopped uh, issuing product, right, it was November, December, uh, we were like, you know, hitting this uh, growth curve and then our issuing bank called us and said, okay, you know what, you need to stop issuing cards. And then there was like a big battle for, for two months when we didn't issue cards and uh, we thought we will go out of business, uh, it was terrible. And uh, since then we, we decided to run everything in-house, don't rely on banks anymore. So now we have our own uh, principal membership of uh, MasterCard, uh, Visa. We're building processing in-house. We applied for banking license. So just, you know, to, to be able to, to be as independent as possible. Um, there's actually a good question on, uh, on Slido. Uh, thank you, by the way, everybody who's uh, putting questions in. Keep them coming. Um, that fits in quite nicely here. Um, Tom's is saying, how did you get the trust of customers to transfer their money to Revolut? Because uh, you're not a bank. Yeah. Trust is a very important thing in, in what you do. How, how do you build that trust? Yeah, I remember two years ago, uh, all people were saying that our product is too, too good to be true, and uh, no one believed us. Uh, but then they just you know, try for uh, 10 euros, 100 euros, you know, 1,000 euros. So they, they try with uh, small amounts, uh, then they increase it because they start trusting, because it works. What, what sort of communications are you having with consumers and with users on a regular basis to build that trust, to keep that trust high? Because I can imagine you can't just expect people to, to put their money in. Um, although having said that, uh, people are doing that every single day at the moment with, uh, with crypto exchanges. They're just throwing their money at them for, for no reason and uh, then finding they can't get it out afterwards, which is uh, kind of fun. Um, how do you... You know, how do you actually build that trust on a regular basis? What are the communications you use? What are some of the technologies you use to actually drive all of this as well? Because I imagine you've got quite an interesting marketing technology stack at this point to, to keep up with everything. Well, to be honest, we don't do much, right? So we just have a, a community forum. Uh, we also have a communication team, uh, which communicates to users if something goes wrong. And then uh, the key here is to be absolutely transparent, right? If we, if we have some problems, right? If we are, for example, down, uh, we are openly telling uh, users about it and then just making sure it doesn't happen again. So uh, other banks will, will, will try to hide, you know, things uh, that, that are wrong. So we're very open. Yes, we are kind of, you know, startup. We're we growing like crazy. Yes, sometimes we can be not very reliable, but uh, we're working on it. So, yeah. talk to me about the funding situation because um, I think you are now close to 90 million in funding. Correct. Um, you know, a lot of people here probably are, you know, running startups in some way, shape, or form, and the you know dream for them is to to get somebody else's money so they can really do some something interesting and uh, expand and 
you know, go and spend that money in really fun ways, uh, not on ping pong tables and ball pool rooms, please, people. Uh, we've done that. Um, so, you know, how how did you get in? You know, the funding. What's the process look like? You know, how can people get started on that journey? Well, it's, it's a creepy process. Uh, I don't really like it. Um, but reality is, uh, uh, the first time is always difficult, right? And uh, I remember when we raised. Uh, so initially, I started uh, doing everything for for my own money. So I hired a team. Uh, we built the product, and we had initial, I think, 500 clients. And then, obviously, you're kind of you know uh, running a relatively big team, right? With uh, with a lot of cash burns, and business doesn't generate you know uh, a lot of money. It just uh, burns. And then you need to raise. So uh, for a seed round, well, for seed round, uh, we uh, raised uh, one and a half million dollars, so one, one million pounds. Uh, and uh, it was tough. So I spent like you know three, four months, just you know, uh, randomly bumping into people, investors, like pitching them. Uh, but then you you learn uh, how to do it, right? And then uh, sooner or later you'll you'll find people who will uh, give you money. And investors, they are all uh, thinking like a crowd, right? So if one guy wants to invest, then you know, suddenly everyone wants to invest. Or if uh, like, you know, one guy doesn't want to invest, then you know, no one wants to invest. So that, that's how they think. And the uh, first three months, you know, no one wanted uh, to invest. They were kind of you know, on the side. And then uh, uh, one fund decided to invest. And then suddenly uh, we received you know, so, so many calls that uh, people want to invest as well. So this first round was uh, the most painful. Uh, took three, four months to get done. Uh, but then uh, subsequent, or you know, were much easier. I think Series A we've done in in one month, and then uh, Series B just you know two weeks. Because as as business grows, right, as it brings you know more money, you, you don't really need money. And then our investors are like you know emailing you every day, calling you every day, just you know asking uh, you to to get their money, and then it becomes super easy. So you just you know pick pick people. So that, that's interesting. I mean, what when you're pitching to investors continually, you, you probably got a lot of no's and rejections and not interested before you got to the, the people that said yes, we'll give you money. Was there something you changed in your approach in your pitch that was uh, you know a point where they started to sound more interested? Uh, yeah, I think things always change. So before I ask for money, and now they 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 are asking us to take money, right? So that's completely different. So. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it just power is on your side now, right? Before power was on the investor side. And you know, how do you get to uh, the point where you say, okay, 90 million, that's that's a, a decent raise. You know, it's a good amount of money. Um, how do you uh, how do you pitch that to them in terms of that valuation? Why that amount of money? Why do you need that? What are you spending that on? Where does that go? Uh, well, good question. To be honest, there is no kind of, you know, uh, in startups there is no valuation uh, based on uh, revenue or growth, right? It's, I would say it's more supply-demand. So, I don't know, we, we decided to raise, you know, 40 million last round, right? And then I go to invest and say, okay, I want to raise 40. Uh, we don't really explain how we spend it. It just, you know, feels the right number. <laughs> and. <laughs> But yeah, well, when you start raising, um, this 40 becomes like 70 for some reason because there are too, too many people, you know, uh, wanting to invest and you don't want to disappoint, uh, like, you know, some, some, <laughs> some, some big funds, you want them on, on your side. So yeah, it's, it's a thing in there, to be honest with you. Uh, so we have a new use for the Slido app. Um, you can now put suggestions in on how uh, Nick should spend that money. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, do feel free to throw a few suggestions in. We can, we can, we can help you. We can all help you. Um, there's a, in terms of what you're doing now, it's very consumer-based. Um, great question here from uh, Damantas. Um, any plans in terms of moving into the B2B market, um, like you know, issuing loans for SMEs or something similar to that? What, what does that yeah, look like? Yeah, we, we've done it already. So we, we issued a business product uh, about half a year ago, and it's doing amazing, right? So we are now having 9,200 companies every day, uh, opening accounts uh, with Revolut. And um, I think just upside is uh, huge and unlimited. This this business will be uh, much bigger than the retail business. It's just uh, probably you know majority of you uh, use Slack, right? Or some of you who, who runs businesses uh, use Stripe. So we want to be the same. We want to to give uh, 21st century bank account, which is seamlessly integrated with all your other systems. So with your HR system, payroll system, 
your Slack, uh, yeah, everything, you know, working together very seamlessly through, through API connections. No one is doing it at the moment for some reason, and uh, we are the first one, as usual. And uh, yeah, business is flying. So look, we've, we've talked about organic growth rather than buying people. We've talked about how you uh, raised your funding. Um, but you know, how many people are you at this moment now? So I think we are 320 or 350 people now. Okay, so you know, when, you, when you build a company, usually it's just a few people, you all know each other really well, uh, or you think you know each other really well, and then you find out things, but you know, that sometimes happens. Um, and then you know, you're building and building building, but you've got to set a culture. You've got to make sure that everybody has a shared goal and really understands what the company is all about. Talk, talk to us about how you set that culture. Talk to us about how you make sure that everybody is on the right page. Mm -hmm. Uh, two years ago, so I uh, sat down, you know, with, uh, with other team members, and then we, we wrote down uh, certain principles how we want to operate and behave, um, and uh, they're, they're still there. Uh, so we, we prepared uh, a cultural deck, and then for every new join us, uh, we well, I do presentation, right? Well, what is our culture? How we behave? What we want to achieve? Uh, and then. Uh, it's funny to see, like, you know, every, every month I'm doing it for, for new joiners, and then uh, I've done it uh, for, for January as well, and I was surprised we were onboarding, like, you know, 40 people, and it was uh, across three offices, so it was, like, you know, probably the largest uh, presentation, cultural presentation I've done. Usually it was, you know, one, two, three, four, five people. Now we're onboarding, you know, 40 a month. And the principles uh, are very simple, right? So our number one thing is uh, get shit done. Um, I think that's uh, the key to success. Uh, you know, never settle, be hungry, uh, always innovate, um, team play as well. How do, you, how do you balance that with still making sure that people um, aren't killing themselves doing this? Because, you know, there's, there's been a massive push, especially in Silicon Valley, um, for everyone to hustle, hustle, hustle all the time. And people are working incredibly long hours, and sometimes that's not good for their physical health, um, and it's quite often very bad for their mental health. How do you make sure you still retain that balance and make sure that people still have a lives whilst getting shit done? I had, you know, a few clashes, for example, with, with investors about this culture, right? Because obviously it's like, you know, pushing people to limits, and uh, we, we work like crazy, right? Uh, I work like probably like 14 hours every day, I work weekends, uh, a lot of people uh, are the same, right? And uh, externally it creates an image of, you know, a very ruthless uh, young organization, and uh, it, it definitely uh, kind of, you know, puts aside people who don't really want to work uh, hard, or for example, people who have families, etc. Uh, but my point to, to people who object to this culture was, uh, no one is really kind of, you know, uh, pushing people to work these hours, right? Uh, it's more up to them. So they, if they really want to achieve something, right, they, they kind of, you know, go to their limit. And then if they stay, you know, within the limit for a certain period of time, their, their limits are increasing, right? So it's not like people are being burned. They're just, you know, like, same as going to the gym. Uh, you just increase your weights slowly. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you, you know, personally do to make sure that you keep balance? Because I would imagine in your position at the company, you're really pushing hard all of the time and focus, 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 but you must have you know, light to the shade, otherwise it will drive you crazy, right? Yeah, I do a lot of sports, uh, and then I also do kitesurfing. So for me, uh, that's the best uh, way to kind of you know, switch off. I don't know if you, if you ever tried it, this is amazing, I definitely suggest. Uh, I'm already doing it for five years, and uh, it's great. You have wind, right, it's warm, you are kiting, you do jumps, and then it, it really kind of, you know, relaxes you. So two, three days kiting, and then back, back to work. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, um, we've got some questions here. I wanted to leave a, a little bit of time for, for some of these questions. Um, Raitis says, uh, should I use Revolut if I mostly travel in the EU, and if yes, why? Yes, you do, because uh, apart from, you know, giving you effects rates, uh, we give you, you know, other products, such as you can buy with us uh, cryptocurrencies at best possible prices. So if you take, for example, Coinbase pricing and uh, Revolut pricing for uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, it will be uh, probably eight times cheaper uh, compared to them. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, you can have, you know, you can buy insurance with us. Uh, you can have premium account with us. 
you can open business accounts with us. Uh, so we, we give you a lot more uh, on top of uh, just FX rates. And uh, Artis, um, I think you've put extra H's in your name there. It's a very look, H H H T I S. Um, but uh, will Revolut eventually offer savings accounts and saving up for age pensions? Yes. So there is a big project we're working on now. It's uh, it's called Wealth. Uh, so so in the app, in 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 the more tab, you will see a wealth, a separate tab, and then within this tab, you'll be able to invest money in uh, ETFs. You'll be able to buy and sell stocks. And you will also be able to uh, put money in different uh, saving accounts. So we'll give you effectively a platform for putting money in, in, in different banks in, in Europe and then outside of Europe with, with different rates. There's, um, you know, Romain has asked a question about uh, challenging existing, uh, you know, competitors, um, and uh, listed a whole bunch of them, you know, Monzo, Starlink, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, that opens up actually just an interesting question about competition. Um, there's two schools of thought on competition, which is, you know, ignore them and just do your thing, or learn everything about them so that you can find the weaknesses and maybe, you know, fill a niche. What's your approach? Do you, do you care about the competition, or are you just trying to build your thing? Uh, well, competition for me is like uh, we're going hunting, right? And competition is what we hunt, right? So it, it kind of, you know, motivates you to, to be faster, to, to win, right? Otherwise, we'll all be too relaxed. So, you know, I, I used to personally, I mean, I'm a journalist now, I'm an analyst as well, but I used to, to run software companies. That's what we used to call startups for everybody who's not old enough. Um, and uh, one of the things I did was, was ignore the competition completely. Um, I focused solely on what I was doing. And uh, what that allowed me to do was just very, be very focused on our mission and, and not try and put in features just for the sake of of being niche or just for the sake of, of plugging gaps. Do you do that or, or do you actually look at every single detail of what the others are doing? Uh, well, I, ha I have a bit different approach, so I agree with this. It works as well, right? Uh, we have more like an uh, approach when we try a lot of new things all the time. Um, and for this, you need to have eyes open, right? So you need to make sure you know what's going on in the world, you know what's going on with uh, competing companies. What are they? What products are they releasing? What is flying? What is not flying? What brings in money? What what doesn't work? Right. So you keep your eyes open and uh, things that uh, work for competition. Right. We also do as well. And uh, Romain asks, um, how will you lead the switch to a banking license as your as your business model is uh, built on the fact that you're an electronic money institution? How do we switch? Uh, very simple. We'll uh, send you. Uh, Notification that terms and conditions changed, and we're now a bank. Simple as that. Yeah, <laughs> it's not as simple as that from your side, surely. No, no, not as simple as that from from our side. Yeah, but for for you, it will be simple. Yeah, I mean, what kind of effort is involved on on your side, and how long do you think that will take? Uh, well, it's costly, it's uh, lengthy. There is a uh, quite a big team involved now, so it's obviously like you know, legal team, operations team, uh, development team as well. It's, it's a big project to get done. And are you having to hire additional people to make that happen, or are you using uh, this Yes, that? definitely. So, because uh, what is a bank is effectively a license to um, take money f from your client deposits and then uh, lend money to to other clients or businesses. Uh, but to get it done, you really need to build like you know proper systems, uh, legal framework, and uh, it takes time. You've you've done a lot in two and a half years. You've built um, a really big community. You've grown very fast. You've got uh, an amazing, uh, you know, couple of funding rounds. It's all going well, but obviously it's it's not all been uh, a smooth journey along the way. We've already discussed some of the things that uh, that went wrong, and you changed and you pivoted. Imagine that we could put you in a time machine and send you back to the start, but you're able to keep all of the knowledge and experience and understanding that you've built over the last two and a half years. What would be the very first thing you would do if you had to do it all again to set yourself up for success? Uh, so you mean uh, which, which mistakes would I not do and which things I would do, right, again? Yeah, I mean, what, what would be the very first thing and, and, you know, how would you set yourself up for success if you could do it all again from the, from the start? Uh, well, I would probably do everything again uh, in the same way, but uh, obviously with experience uh, I would do it uh, much faster, right, because... Uh, I remember when I was uh, just, you know, uh, doing an investigation how to build it, and uh, every single person, you know, in, in payments industry said, said to me it's not possible. 
right? And then uh, I ended up, you know, hiring uh, best consultant in the industry. So I called him and then, uh, you know, I explained what I want to do. And then uh, he just, you know, said, okay, not possible. He, he hang up. And then, uh, okay, I called him again. And then uh, I asked him to come to the office, uh, spend with us two days. Uh, and then just explain how, how the whole payments industry work. Just because, I mean, I didn't know. So he, he came and then he uh, spent it with us two days explaining step by step how MasterCard works, Visa works, issuing banks work, processing works. Um, and uh, yeah, we took all the information in and then in two weeks we, we called him again and said, okay, why, why don't we do it this way? And then he said, okay, that, that might work. So obviously this process would be you know, much shorter because I already know how to do it. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, listen, Nick, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us on stage today. Uh, wonderful, please give a warm round of applause. Thank you guys.